And good morning, good afternoon, or good night, wherever you may be in the world. Uh, welcome to episode three of Dad Chats uh, from the Indestructible Dad. Uh, today I've got uh, Brad Odkers uh, joining us. And a uh, little known fact, there's three, three very influential people in my career. Uh, number one, Brad Sugars. Number two, Grant Cardone. And number three, the one and only Brett Odkers from... Where are you from, Brett? Where in Sydney are you from? Sydney, mate. Hey, I'm pretty pleased to be in that kind of company. That's uh, that's pretty good company to, to be in. It's pretty it's pretty mad because, you know, you've got those guys, you know, they're flying around in their jets and, you know, in a couple of years... I'm got not. A jet, but... Uh, <laughs> I'm in my cars. But I mean, but I mean when, you, when you break it all back down, um, you know, I've written a book because of you. Yeah. And how many other people have written books because of you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's pretty cool. That's pretty cool. I appreciate it. It's good. Yeah, mate. Look, I'm in. I'm in Sydney. I'm Sydney born and bred. I've uh, I've travelled a lot of the world, and I have never found anywhere I like living more than Sydney. So um, I travel a lot. Love it. But I'm staying in Sydney. So uh, yeah, that's where I'm from. It's love really cool. I love helping people write books. It's uh, it's it's such an interesting thing. Uh, we were just chatting just before that um, there was a, a survey in America done where it said um, eighty one percent of American adults would like to write a book. Eighty one, uh, but it's massive, isn't it? Right now, obviously they're not business books or they're not you know um, novels or anything, but um, it, people want to get their ideas out you know, into a form, which is, which it's kind of an ancient thing, having a book. It's, it's a really a cool thing and it gets edited and you're mm-hmm. testing your ideas and uh, yeah, you know, it's great to see your book come out. And, you know, I've, I've now got about 50 people from all over the world that have, that are either are working or have, have done their book. And uh, it's, it's very cool to see you guys uh, take that next leap. Yeah, well, I can. I'm pretty sure I can speak for everyone. We really appreciate your um, your guidance and your your passion for it because so many times writing, you know, I know my book was what two years in the making, and yeah. it's just ever evolving. But there's one thing you mentioned was progress, not perfection. I think we'll jump back to progress, not perfection later on because um, we're forgetting something completely, completely, uh, very, very important. Yeah, you 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 help people write books. You're a business coach. You help people run their businesses and scale them to great sizes and, you know, um, live a very, very fulfilling life. But you're married, been married just over 30 years. Just over 30 years. Yep. Just celebrated our 30th anniversary last year. Wow. wow. Which I'm pretty pleased with. I would be too. I, I think we're, we hit 12 this year. Um, oh, I, hope, I, hope it's 12. I hope it's 12. Uh, Katrina, will <laughs> the podcast and be like, 30 is an easier number to remember. It's just so real. It's just, all, it's, it's just way better. Um, and then apart from... And, and I, just, I just say, look, I, I, I met the woman I never wanted to be apart from yep. when, I was a, when I was young. So, yeah. you know, I'm very, very happy to have journeyed through life with her. Oh, that's brilliant. I, I actually, uh, not many people know this, but I actually met Katrina at Warwick Farm down in Sydney. Oh, was, really? Yeah, yeah, in the racing stable and... Um, I don't know. I, I used to be one of those guys that, you know, you'd go out and, you know, have fun and whatever. And um, yeah, this, this Irish girl walked in and I was like, who's that? Some, someone breaking into our stables and, oh no, no, we've got this new girl from Ireland. Oh yeah, that's good. And then the next morning, I think I got a name wrong. She told me to fuck off. And then you know, <laughs> she, was, she was hooked. She was hooked from that stage. <laughs> um, but, uh, but getting back to you, 30 years of marriage and how many kids? We got three kids. Yeah. Yeah. Three kids. They're not kids anymore either, are they? They're no, no. So my, my, I still think of them as kids, uh, mostly cause they're all still living at home and I need to continue to work to support them. But, uh, yeah, I've, I've got a 20 year old, uh, yep. and, um, uh, he goes to, uh, TAFE, he's uh, doing uh, theatre production design. So he's really good at building weird stuff that you see in the backs of film sets and stuff like that. 
Yeah. Um, and my middle boy, uh, who's just left high school last year, um, and my daughter, who's uh, in year 10, and right in the thick of teenage ness which is a fun challenge. But yeah, it's a, yeah I, I love being a dad, and I know a lot of people say that. Uh, it actually, uh, the reason I say it is that I very, very nearly wasn't a dad. Uh, so when we, we kind of had been married for a bunch of years and in our late twenties sort of thought, okay, it's time to, time to start having a family yeah. and zip, nada, nothing was happening. Wow. Um, and so we went for a couple of years trying to have kids, nothing. Uh, and long story short, went on this, I think it was about a six year journey trying to have kids, IVF, you know, the whole shebang. Yeah. Um, and so for six years, I, uh, it's pretty like, it's a real challenge actually, because especially when you're on an IVF, um, cycle, your, your emotions are up and down, you know, my wife's just pumped full of chemicals to, uh, to get all the stuff happening. And so she's all over the place. Yes. Um, and then, you know, when it, when it doesn't work, it's devastating. It's like a death in the family. Yeah. And so, so for six years, uh, I had to seriously consider, okay, what, what would life be like without being a dad? Uh, I'm a real family guy. I like being in a family. So, yeah. uh, and, and we looked at, you know, adoption and everything. We looked at the whole gamut, you know, of, uh, what, what we could do. And then finally, finally an IVF, um, uh, cycle worked and we got our first child. Wow. Um, and, you know, and then we had to do another one for our second child and our third child came along naturally. Um, so, so I nearly wasn't a dad. Wow. And, uh, and that really had to, it made me think, you know, what, what, I don't want to waste this basically. You know, I thought I don't want to be a dad who goes to work. Lots of my friends are, have got the big corporate jobs and so they leave home at six in the morning and they do the big corporate thing and they come back and they, you know, they get home at seven or eight o'clock. And when your kid's are little, yeah. they don't get to see you. You know, that's, that's done. Um, and I never wanted to do that. So I, I thought, no, I've worked really hard and frankly spent a buttload of money on IVF to be a dad. Yeah. Um, you know, I, it, it was hard fought for. So I thought, I don't want to waste it. So I, I really made certain that everything I did was built around um, enjoying being a dad and enjoying being present uh, you know so I my work you know I always made my work so that when the kids were at school I could drop them off and pick them up uh, which meant you know sort of you know I had to take take time out at 9 30 to drop them off I had to take time out at 3 30 to pick them up and then listen to their complaining on the way home and sort them out and all that stuff so <laughs> you know I've, I've made certain I've yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. The, the, the how was your day, Dal? And then, blah, and I hear about how her day was. Yeah. You know, it's not, not always the easiest. Uh, and then you've got to come back, you know, get back to work, drop them off, make them some afternoon tea, and then get back to work in a good state of mind. It's, it's a bit of a challenge sometimes. It's, it's but mad. yeah. yeah. It's mad. I, I, remember, I remember when we were back in, uh, back in Goulburn, um, I was doing the same thing. I was, yeah, school drop off, school pick up. That was my choice, uh, yeah. you know, seeing clients at nine o'clock at night in the office, you know, uh, seeing them at 6 a.m. because that, that was the choice I made. Um, getting up at 4 a.m. to do a bloody webinar, you know, before, yeah. before business. Yeah. Office, you know what I mean? It's, it's crazy what you sort of add into it. Um, yeah. Well, back, so back then I was, um, the, the first 20 years of my career, I was a photographer and a film director. Yeah. And so I worked in the advertising industry doing television commercials and all that stuff. And uh, I actually really enjoyed uh, when I could bring my kids with me to work. So, you know, one, one time before one of the World Cups, I had to photograph a couple of the Socceroos for uh, Wheat Bix or someone like that. You know, we had a, a whole bunch of Socceroos. And... Um, Socceroos are pretty, you know, professional sports people are not known for being particularly good performers in front of the camera. And so what I did was I brought my two boys along who were, I don't know, seven and eight at the time or something like that. Yeah. And, uh, and I thought, 
I bet these footballers would relax if they're playing football with the kids. Yeah. Um, and uh, the boys came along and got to meet their heroes, which we then saw in the World Cup. And, you know, so there's some pretty, like, like there's an element of, no, 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 it's work, keep the kids away. And I thought, no, 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 no. Let's yeah. drag them in and, and bring them along for the ride. And, you know, it actually is really good. So now we regularly see these uh, football superstars and they're like, oh, I remember when we had that afternoon with them. They think of it as a great game, but it was actually incredibly helpful to, to actually get the photographs that I wanted to get out of them. Absolutely. And, and, and I know uh, one of them is, a, is a, one of your kids is a diehard Liverpool support, supporter. Um, well, you know, I brought him up right. Very, very good taste, I must say. Yep, yep, yep. I agree. I, I tell you, well, he's developed that taste from me, of course. Yeah. I, I, fantastic, uh, I, fantastic dating there. Game over. <laughs> <laughs> Champions of Europe six times. Yes. yes. You well, know. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, we, oh, one of the things, um, one of the really fun things that I did last year was uh, I, we hadn't had a holiday as a, a big holiday uh, in years. And the last time my wife and I traveled overseas together was before the kids were around. So we saved up and put some money aside and we went over to Europe for, um, for a bit of a holiday uh, at Christmas. So that was the first sort of proper big holiday I'd had in 20 years. And uh, we made sure that we did a bypass up to, up to Liverpool and we made sure that we did the Liverpool um, uh, tour. So my, my middle boy, uh, Jamie, and I went and sat in, uh, in the change room, the home room, and sat in the away room and, you know, walked on to Anfield. And, you know, it was just an unbelievable experience. And I think about all the things that I could have spent that money on, you know, I could have got a new car or another guitar or I could have been sensible and put it into superannuation. But you know what? The memories of he and I and and the whole family, but in that day in particular, the memories of that every time Liverpool's playing, we're like, Oh yeah. Yeah. Remember when we stood there and we sat in that chair and it was fantastic. It was Mm. such a great, investment it was a good day like it hurt like it cost a bit of money oh, it would have been ridiculous it would yeah. have been, you know because <laughs> you're paying in euro in uh, uh, rather yeah. english pounds so everything's like double and you're like oh so that's why only two of us went not the whole family but exactly you know, you know it was it was probably i won't say a regret of mine like we were in ireland for six years um yeah. seven and you know it's just across the it's just across the the ditch you know it's a yep it's a three-hour ferry ride from Dublin to Liverpool, uh, Holyhead. Um, yeah, it just didn't go. You know, there was <laughs> one thing or another, and it's like, oh, it's all right, I'll watch it on TV, I'll watch it at a pub, watch it with the Liverpool supporters club there and kill yep. their town, which was crazy. Uh, but, you know, it's one of those things, like when they sing, you'll never walk alone. Like, you're, yeah. Yeah, it's impossible. It's impossible not to watch footage from people, you know, recording it, and and either get some spine tingling feeling or well yeah. it's just yeah. powerful you know it's incredible and every the thing about it we unfortunately we didn't get to see a game because uh, the, they were paying away when we were actually there but every brick in that building is imbued with mm. that feeling mm. and it's extraordinary you know um one of the one of the really cool things we got to do was we went through where the players go and we went into the players change room mm. and then we went down the tunnel of um that the players go down and there's an there's an anfield uh sign that they touch you know they give it a kiss before they go on field and then there's a i think they call it the champions walkway and you know which is basically the players entrance onto the field mm. and what's really cool is down there it says we are liverpool this means more mm. And that's what I love about that club, that it's more than football. Like yeah. it's, it's about the whole community. And we actually got to talk to some uh, former players. Uh, we, we had lunch with a couple of former players um, and to, just, just to ask them these questions and hear them talking about it was just extraordinary. So, yeah, yeah I, you know, an, an unforgettable experience with, with my soccer mad boy. We're all we're all soccer mad here, but that was that was pretty cool. That was that was the thing. So what what did the rest of the family do when you guys were at Anfield? Uh, well, we went to Liverpool for two reasons. One to to do the the 
Liverpool FC. Mm. Um, but as you can see, I play uh, play a guitar and um, I love the Beatles. And so we wanted to just go and soak up a bit of Beatles stuff and and then the football stuff. And we I think we'd only allowed like two days or something. We were going to drive up there, do a few things, go home. But we absolutely loved Liverpool. It's such a vibrant place. Yeah. Um, and so the the rest, the, so Kath and, and the other two went to the Liverpool Cathedral, which is one of the most extraordinary cathedrals in in Europe. It was amazing. And so, to a certain extent, I feel like I missed out on the Liverpool Cathedral because I didn't get to see it <laughs> that day. Um, but I did get to see where John mm. Paul, George, and Ringo, you know, did their stuff. Uh, we got to sit in the pub where the uh, there's a, a uh, carpool karaoke um, yep. episode where um, Paul McCartney played. You know, we got to sit in that pub and, you know, it was great. It's an amazing city. I, yep. I didn't expect it to be as extraordinary uh, because I, I sort of think of Liverpool as an industrial bland kind of city, yep. but no, it's anything but. So, yeah, I'm a, I'm a bit of a fan. We'll, we'll be going back at some point. Hey, hey. I want to see a home game. Or see a home game. That's that's yeah. it. Yeah, a home get a home game in the cough, You know that'll be. Yeah, yeah it'd be. I think there's a waiting list. Uh, last time I heard, but anyway, that's what can you do? Yeah, yeah. yeah we got we got time. Got time. <laughs> and, and tell me when when you were making that um, that holiday when you were building that holiday with your family. What what yeah. input did the kids have? Like, what did they say? Hey, Dad, we want to see this. We want to, you know, what general areas are we going? Did they say, you know? A, B, and C, you know, can we see yeah. that? So we, we um, you know, we had a little bit of money set aside and we thought, what would we like to do? And initially we were going to go to Canada because Kath and I have never been to Canada. Yep. Um, but we, we started sort of thinking, oh, we'd really love to show them Europe and everyone got excited about Europe. Um, Jamie, all he wanted to see was, um, was Liverpool, right? And... Uh, uh, my daughter Gracie, the the number one thing she wanted to see was the Harry Potter studios in London, which were extraordinary, amazing experience. Um, my older boy, who's into all the uh, production design, uh, he was really keen to see the French and Italian um, uh, stuff, but they they actually didn't really know what to expect until we got there. So. I was surprised at how little input they wanted. I think they were just happy to go on the adventure. Um, and we, we did it with one of the things we discovered is that my wife and I, who are in our fifties now, have more energy and more stamina than all of our teenagers put together. Yeah. Yeah. So you kind of have to well, allow for that. Like by three o'clock, they want to go back to the hotel room and we're like, we're in London, you know, like. It's pub time. It's pub time. Drink time. What are you talking about? We're going to have a pint and then go again. Right, right. Um, uh, so we have more stamina than they did. And I think they were just happy to be there. The really cool thing was they're at the age where they're going to start partnering up. You know, my oldest has a girlfriend now and I can't see that we'll be able to uh, go away on a holiday without having extra people. Yes. So this was a chance for us to be a family together, just experiencing whatever yeah. happen like flat tires in the middle of the country in Italy and missed train connections and whatever, you know, all the stuff, good yeah. and bad. Yeah. Um, we just got to hang out together and it was, it was just having time to be together. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, uh, we're going through Venice and, you know, I'm, I've got quite a lot of art training. So, you know, I can talk about, you know, the, the way art and history has affected, um, you know, the way we live now, you know, and, and our, you know, socio-political uh, influence. And so, you know, we'd be in Venice and I'd be talking about all the different paintings and, and <laughs> they'd go, gosh, Dad, you know a lot of stuff about this, don't you? I'm like, yeah, I do, actually. And, you know, in Paris, we're talking about the, the influence of... Um, of modern art and how that's profoundly affected the technology. You know, the phones we have can be directly traced back to turn of the century art movements and stuff like that. And they're like, they're riveted. Yeah. You know, and, and we're seeing the art and we're seeing the place they live and, and, you know, so just making space to yeah. do that 
So yeah. what we didn't do was we didn't have something programmed every day. We went, we're going to lob in this place for a week and this place for a week and this place for a week. And so, you know, we we're in Paris for a week and there's a lot you could do. But, yeah. you know, the thing I remember most is charging around the streets on electric scooters with the kids. Yeah. You know, zipping through the back streets, you know, which we didn't know existed until we got there. Yeah. Um, you know, or, or getting literally lost in the back streets trying to find a museum in Venice, uh, you know. So that space for that, I mean, that for us that was Europe, but yeah. if so, that's a soccer field or sailing or out back Australia, I don't think it matters. There's yeah. precious little time to just make space to hang out together. So, so we're removing expectations, uh, you know, we're, we're in this area. Yeah. There's yeah. no expectations. We're just chilling. We're just doing our thing. You know, no, I, I did expect them to be a bit more like, oh, we're in Paris, let's go. Yep. But they were like, we've been going for four hours and I'm exhausted. I'm going back to watch Netflix. And yep. I'm like, dude, seriously? Yeah. I think, I think <laughs> we're in maybe, Paris. Maybe, maybe that's a reflection on you guys parenting. Like you guys are just done an awesome job. They just like, yeah, we're in Paris. We're halfway around the world. You know, <laughs> we're on the other side of the planet. Yeah. yeah, yeah. It's all good. Um, yeah, I've seen other things before. You know, I'm, <laughs> you know, take it in. Us, you know, resilient kids, you know. <laughs> well, the really cool thing about, so, so we never travelled with them when we were young. And, and that's a bit hard, actually, because a lot of our friends, had, you know, by the time their kids were 10, had travelled overseas. That was just that corporate merry-go-round that we could never get on and, and decided not to. Travelling is ridiculous. You know, yeah, we, but we just, in we just, this older... Yeah. Yeah, now that they're older, you know, you could say, hey, and we, one of the expectations we said uh, up front was, uh, if you guys want to go home at any point, you go, but that's not going to stop us. So wow. if we want to go and see the this, we're going to see it, <laughs> yeah. you know, and, um, you know, they can, we can drop them home and then keep going, but they're old enough to actually find their own way home. So give them a metro map and, and they'll, they'll get there. Metro, you know, I'll give, buy yeah. them an Oyster card and the Metro map and yeah. they'll yeah. sort it out. They and then what's really cool is they can just text you when they're back. Yeah. I, I found, I, I found, and this is from living in Sydney, visiting, visiting Paris, you know, and a couple of other Euro um, nations. I found it, if you can navigate the Sydney tra train map <laughs> uh, and get somewhere on time, you can get, you could be put anywhere on the planet and you could make your way around the town easy. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Even in France, like we, you know, some and even when I, yeah, even in France, like we were going to Disneyland there one time, and you know, we just looked at the map. Oh yeah, we'll get this this day. You know, this platform bank done. You know what I mean? Yeah, uh, it's and they like working that out. Yeah, it's like an adventure. They like it. It's an adventure. Yeah. you know, it public totally public, is public transport one hundred and one in Europe. <laughs> so, but I, I tell you what, what's so. I think of it like an investment yeah. in the sense that if I invest some money in something, I expect it to return to me. And the more it returns to me, the better the investment. Yeah. Think about this particular family holiday like that. We invested money in it and quite literally every day I'm thinking, you know, I'm thinking, Oh yeah, this, you know, we're talking about visiting Anfield or, I'm remembering the time we stood in the, uh, the museum line for, for an hour and a half and we talked about that. Or, you know, we'll watch something and, and you know, one of the kids will go, oh, we went down that street. Or, yeah. Yeah. you know, that's an incredible return on investment. Yeah, absolutely. Like, and, 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 and what's really interesting is, even though I spent the money last year, that will return on investment for the rest of my life yeah. and the rest of their lives. Yeah. Yeah. And so think about the platform for their kids now, you know, like right. you, you've set a standard. I, and I, I, I don't, you know, know about your childhood or anything, but could you have, Oh, um, I didn't go to Europe. Yeah. I mean, we, my dad, my dad, uh, he didn't hop on a plane until I said, we're going to Cairns, uh, you know, later this year. And he went, what? And I said, oh, I've booked us two tickets to go to Cairns cause I want to go for yeah. a hop and you're doing nothing. You're just working. So, you know, you yeah. know, and he was, I think he yeah. was 40s by that stage. Yeah. 
Oh could... no, we couldn't afford that. So I've, I've been working since I was 10 years old. Yeah. You know, like I had to earn my own way when I was young. And, and so, do, you, yeah. do you think that, that ever worked against you? Like, um, you know, cause every step that you sort of, you, you push that, that come, that comfort sphere outwards. Yep. You didn't grow up doing that, you know? Um, yeah. I well, I think there's an independence, you know, like my kids, um, my wife had a different experience. She, she didn't have part-time jobs, but I, I literally, cause at, at 10, my mum, you know, they couldn't afford much. And she said, look, we'll feed and house you. And, you know, but if you want to go to the movies, you got to earn your own money. Yeah. You know, if you want to, if you want to buy extra stuff, you've got to do it yourself. And at the time I sort of thought, oh, that sucks. Yeah. But it gives, it, it gave me a real um, independence. Yep. And, and a, it, okay, here's something to work. You know, I want to push bike. I'm going to save up my money. I'm going to work. I'm going to get the push bike. Yeah. I think that's really a quality that I quite like because it makes me very independent. Yeah. And it, and it also makes me very, um, uh, responsible. Yeah. You know, because it's like, okay, well, I'm, I'm not just going to sit here waiting for someone else to do it. Yeah. Uh, it's a different world for our kids now, a really different world. Cool. Um, and, and I guess there's, there's a part of me that goes, I'll get off your ass and go and get a part-time job. Yep. Um, there's, there's definitely that part of me. But then there's the other part of me that says, isn't it cool that I've built a life and that I earn enough money that they don't have to. Yeah. That they can just go to school and just worry about being kids and go to uni and worry about getting set for that. That's pretty cool. Like yeah. that's a, that's, that's something cool. I can feel proud of. That's really awesome. I mean, we, yeah. we you know, um, we're, we're teaching that to the three, oh, well, three of the, well, three of our kids at the moment. Um, Obviously, Sura is too young for, for any chores, but um, yeah, they're doing work for pocket money now, you know. And they were like, right. "Dad, how did you do?" And this is Noah. He's he's turning eleven next week. He goes, um, "Dad, uh, what jobs did you do when you were my age?" And I went, "Well, I used to go do the horses every afternoon and pick up shit and rug them and feed yep. them." He goes, "Horses?" And I was like, "Yeah, you know, because he obviously he's he's been around us training race horses and stuff like that." And mm-hmm. he was like, "You were how, you were eleven? And I was like, no, I was about nine when I started, you know, <laughs> like yeah. you guys don't have to push a wheelbarrow full of horse shit. You guys are right. You know, <laughs> <laughs> the, the, probably the one frustration for me, I think, and it's, and it's not just about my kids. It's about kids in general yep. is that um, I, I'm pretty passionate about being self-employed. Yeah. You know, running your own thing. And, and I've run my own businesses since I was, you know, 23, right? But the thing about it is now every child, no matter how old you are, has the ability to make money by building a little business. Yeah. Yeah. They don't have to go and work for McDonald's. They don't have to go and, you know, they can make a little business. Yeah. Fortunately, I don't think school's really equipping them for that. And I'll give you an example. Uh, when when um, my oldest Lockie, I can't remember how old he was. He must have been thirteen or fourteen, and he wanted he he wanted to build this billy cart. And the billy cart costs uh, the parts for it cost like one hundred and ten dollars, I think. Yeah. And I said, well, how can you earn one hundred and ten dollars? Because I, you know, I'm not just going to give it to you. Mm. Um, I probably should nowadays. I probably would, but you know, back then I went, okay. How? So what we did was we devised a um, a car washing business. Mm-hmm. And what he did was he went to the soccer fields where all the grown-ups are playing soccer and he offered to wash their cars while they were playing soccer. He made his hundred dollars in like one afternoon and then went, cool, I'm done. <laughs> <laughs> what? <laughs> that's um, just the kind of kid he was, right? I mean, but they, that's they, a little they, business. Yeah. That's a little business that I'm like, dude, you could earn a hundred dollars every week if you wanted to, you know? But then one of my other kids cottoned on and I said, well, what if you, what if you sold, like, what if you walked up and down the sports fields in the middle of winter and sold fresh muffins? Do you reckon you could do that? Yeah. And he goes, oh yeah. Now my wife helped him make the muffins and supplied the stuff, but he sold $120 worth of muffins in 20 minutes flat. What? 
Yeah. Because <laughs> if you're if you're gonna you're gonna buy a muffin for two dollars, three dollars. Yeah. And you got four kids. You're buying. You're yeah. buying five muffins. You're you know. Muffins, absolutely. That's why I don't take my kids to hockey. You know, my poor uncle. He he goes, oh yeah, I'll come watch you. And I was like, are you sure? Because, you know, these little terrorists, they're gonna they're gonna hit you up for the canteen. Yeah, yeah, yeah right. And he's like, oh yeah, I spent forty bucks today with them. And I was like, what are you talking <laughs> about? They they eat them. <coughs> they're well fed. Yeah, <laughs> but I'm I'm looking at that going the selling muffins up and down the the, you know, any child could do that. Yeah, yeah. Even if they, you know, obviously if mum and dad pay for the materials, you want to pay them back. But, um, but that's a little business, you know. And, and, of course, you can do amazing business. You know, you could, do, you could sell stuff on the web or do anything. So well, probably my one regret about this current generation is that they don't see that they don't have to be employed. There are so many ways for them to use their creativity and their ingenuity to to earn money other than being employed yeah. and it's really 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 hard to get that through their heads my, my kids have never seen me employed by yeah. someone else yeah and and it's really hard to get him to keep up the muffin business or the car washing business because they, <laughs> they 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 kind of yeah okay that was fun done yeah I, I i think it's i think it's interesting i mean noah noah's after a computer and he's right. like work i have to do these jobs for another 20 weeks to get a computer and i was like well what else could you do like yeah. i was like come on man you you've got you know we could stream we could stream them playing video games right. we could get money from them being affiliate like they could make money from affiliating there's this- a million ways for kids to make money now that's ridiculous like, when i was a kid you know having the nintendo playing super mario 3 was the bee's knees and then yeah. And then year five came around in primary school and it's Mortal Kombat. And now Mortal Kombat right. 11's out and I'm, and I'm begging Noah and Ruin. I'm going, come on, guys, you know, what's, what's trending in Mortal Kombat 11? We need to do an <laughs> part of it. You know? So, I don't know. Yeah. Obviously, obviously, Dad's just trying to be a big kid. Uh, yeah, yeah that, you know, yeah. But there's so many opportunities, but they just don't see it yet. Yeah. <clears throat> One of... Uh, one of um, our mate's kids buys and sells sneakers, like these collectible sp- sneakers. Oh, yeah, it makes, it makes a fortune. Cool. It's a whole business, you know, and, and I just... Gary Vee or something? Uh, I, I, I don't know enough about it, but it's, <laughs> but it's these very fancy... It's like $500 sneakers. So, you know, he actually... Here's the thing. So... Uh, the shops only get certain amounts. So what he does is he pays his mates to go and camp out overnight, get in line to buy these sneakers. And yeah. he pays them. Yeah. Um, but they buy these sneakers and then he, you know, gets, you know, 10 pairs of them and then he sells them online at it, you know, because they're so rare and he makes heaps of money. What a great little business. Genius. Brilliant kid. Oh, lovely. Right? Brilliant, right? But whatever. So that that's probably my challenge with this entire generation is they have no idea how much opportunity, because this is not something we could have done as kids. Not in my, not in my childhood. Absolutely. And it was only, um, I think last, last podcast, I was talking to somebody um, about online bullying, you know, they they had a bit of that with, with their, with their daughter. And I was like, shit, this is, that's something we didn't, you know, I finished school in 2000, you know, there was what, yeah, you know, I think Yahoo or or um, I can't yeah. even remember it. You know, you'd have to Yahoo everything, not Google. You know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Madness. Yeah. Uh, now it's just no. a totally different ball game. They face they face different things, but they face different threats. But they also have alternative opportunities. Yeah. You know. So yeah, it's it's a it's a bit of a passion that I'd I'd like to encourage kids mm. to have a go because that I think that's something that. It's probably a hallmark of what I, you know, me as a, as a business guy and me as a dad is just have a go, say yes and do it. Yeah. You know, yeah. Uh, like the book, you know, um, someone wants to learn how to book, write a book. Cool. Okay. Maybe 20 people do, maybe 50 people do, maybe a thousand people do. So mm. build something that can teach lots of people to write a book. Have but, a go. Have a go. You know, it's, it, and I think there's, I'd love to see more of that in the young people to have a go. 
Absolutely. And and we're, we're probably not the only dads facing uh, that type of uh, challenge with the kids. You deal with a yeah. lot of other dads. Uh, you know, as you said in the corporate, in the corporate world, uh, what are you, what are you hearing around the traps uh, challenge wise from other dads? Look, I think that th the number one challenge I hear, uh, and it's mums as well, actually, but, but particularly from dads is the busyness epidemic. Yeah. Right. And, and they just go, oh, we're so busy. I'm so busy. I'm so busy. I'm so busy. And the, uh, I'm really uh, a, a mate of mine uh, who's very successful business-wise. Yeah. Uh, he he said to me about five or six years ago. He said, "Brett, I reckon lazy is the new smart." Yeah. And and I don't think he doesn't mean lazy because he's not a lazy. But what he what he means is the opposite of busy. Yeah. Like having space in your week is the new smart. Mm. And, and recently, Warren Buffett, you know, one of the best investors in the world said busy is the new dumb yeah and and probably the challenge with that is um if if you guys are anything like me i'm the primary uh, income earner for our house uh my wife does work but but you know i probably bring in 80 percent of the income yeah. so there's a there's a pressure to bring in money there's a pressure to pay the mortgage. There's a pressure to save up for holidays and all that sort of stuff. Yeah. Um, and there, at work, there's a pressure to do more and sell more and be more and build more. And, and then with, you know, community stuff or whatever else you do, there's just constant busyness. Yeah. And, and I, what I'm seeing is that people are busy doing stuff that isn't that important to them. And so the antidote to this is work out what's really, really important to you mm. and stop doing the other shit. Yeah. Just yeah. stop it. You know, like the, um, I, so recently one, one of my favorite books, I've, I've got it out here for you actually, is this book here called Essentialism. Yep. Uh, have you heard, have you seen this book? I've seen the cover. You could it's be really cool, right? <laughs> and, and, and like, if you, if I open that up, basically this is busy, like mm. this is us yeah. and this is actually what we'd like to be like. Yeah. Right? And that's a good analogy, I think, because what the central idea of that book is this do less, but better stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Right. And, and if I think about it, the holiday to Europe, I mean, that was the, the only big holiday we've had in 20 years. So we didn't do it every year, but it was better. It was less, but better. Yeah. And, and I think um, what I'd say to the dads particularly is do less, but do better stuff. Absolutely. Like, in, you know, so whatever that is, right. So I, you know, uh, with my music, you know, I'm, I'm now playing in a band. I'm only playing in one band. Whereas I used to play in about three bands. Yeah. You know, I you've cut all that out. Yeah, Pardon? Which, I was going to say you've you've what you've just obliterated the other bands. You've just consolidated right. it's, into one. It's less but better. Yeah, right. It, yeah. It's a band that is at another level. Mm. And I've thought, well, why keep running around doing all that other stuff with all the difficulties of those? Let's just focus on this. Yeah. Uh, same at work. You know, what am I really, really, really good at? Um, I'm really good at developing. You know, creative, interesting uh, content that moves people and businesses to another place. So do more of that, yeah. right? What am I really not good at? Um, I'm really not good with bookkeeping. I'm really not good with all that boring shit, right? So <laughs> give it to someone else to do, right? And it's funny, it's funny is, you know, even today, um, you know, working with a client that we've, I've pretty much helped them quadruple in about 18 months. Yep. They refuse to understand that it's come down to leveraging off their team. Because right. They they go, oh no, we done that. And I was like, no, that was these two people here. That that's their role. Yeah. You know, one one person actually left last week. They just went, yeah, fuck off. I'm going somewhere else. Yeah. And yeah. They, they didn't tell. Oh, I rocked up today, and um, yeah, this person's gone. I was like, are you are you fucking kidding? How did yeah. you know? Yeah. They were crucial to our success. Like, they were a lovely yeah. part of the organisation. They they helped you out. They freed you up. You yeah. Know? It's, it's the, 
the freaking martyrdom of business owners in particular. Yeah, and it, because they choose to be busy. Yeah, they choose. Busy they, is a choice. You know, and when, when you do, when you break it down, you, you know, you break down, what are you doing? What are you doing? There's five hours of YouTube videos being watched. Right. Okay, and it's like, well, that's five hours of selling could have freed you up to finish. You don't even have to work a Friday if you do it right during the week. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah, that's right. That's not. And I, look, I think that's the same in in parenting too. You know, you know, th- I think there's a lot of stuff that we do that's busy mm. that we could probably stop doing. Yeah. And just focus on the bits of that are really important to you, and that's going to be different for everyone. Yeah. Right. So, you know, um, I, I've coached my kids' soccer teams. You know, and that takes time. You know, it's hard work. Um, but it means I've got to say no to a bunch of other stuff uh, so that I've got time to do that. So I, th- I think the challenges that I see are because uh, lots of men are, are filling up the void with busyness. The other huge impact that makes on us is our mental health. Yeah. Right. Because if you've got this constant track in your head about got to do this and more that and this da 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 da, da the boat, right the car the, the, boat, the, car, the thing the holiday the, the you know, right reach the next sales goal yeah. make sure you go and spend this time with that person and you got to network with them and do, you know no you yeah. don't yeah just stop all that give yourself a little bit of time um and and i so i i actually find that there's a really interesting book out at the moment uh, called Deep Work, and it's looking at the way shallow work or being busy and just doing little bits of work yep. is not producing the results that we really want from our lives or our work. Uh, but deep work is about giving yourself time and space to really um, get into a task or get into a, a project and really do deep work on it. It can't happen if you're checking your email and posting on Facebook and da 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 it just can't happen. Yeah, yeah. You've got to make time somehow, somewhere. Uh, it's, so It's a fascinating correlation, uh, you know, deep work, shallow work. Shallow work, we're treading water. Oh, the business is treading water. Mentally, we're treading water. Our relationship is treading water. Yeah. Uh, because you're not doing the deep work. That's, that's fantastic. fantastic. Right, and the deep work could be grab your grab your other half and piss off for a weekend and yeah. don't plan anything. Just yeah. go stay in a farmhouse or if you're in the farmhouse, stay in the city yeah. and just chill. Just, yeah. you know, go and eat lunch and wander the shops and do nothing, you know. Yeah. Uh, that time, because what happens is you'll get a break, mm. your mind, the track in your mind will get a bit of a break and, um, you know, in the case of a relationship, it'll just give you a chance to talk. Yeah. About anything. I just find it's, I mean, uh, you know, hats off to people who do have those corporate careers and, you know, work the long hours and everything. I mean, I work long hours too, but I'll tell you what, if we don't check in with Katrina a couple of times a day, I, you know, I, I don't know, I get in a mood, I get in a little huffy mood. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's like my other, my, you know, the, um, I guess that, that other part of me, you go, where's that other part of me? I need to, you know, yeah. the, the thing, you know, it's, it's even, even the last time we were at a conference um, together, uh, 2017, I think we were at conference. Yep. Man, I wanted to go home after two days. <laughs> I missed her and the kids. I was like, yeah, I'm coming home. And she's like, no, you have to stay for another two days. And I was like, yeah, <laughs> do I really? I technically yeah. don't have to, I want to get the hell yeah. out of here. Um, yeah. Um, yep. But yeah, I mean, look, there's a lot of, a lot of guys doing it tough out there and, um, yeah, mental health is such a such a big thing. It's huge. I, and I actually think it's something you need to manage every day. Like I have to manage my mental health every day. Yeah. Because it, it, it yeah, sorry, carry on. It, it, because like we're just as a as a coach, as a an entrepreneur, as a father, as a husband, mm. just shit's hitting you all the time, right? And and it's you're dealing with problems all the time. So I have to make space a priority Mm. and that could just be get out and walk around Mm. um the other thing that i think is that 
I think men are way more creative than uh, most people give themselves credit for. Most people say, oh, I don't paint, I don't draw, I don't sing. I'm not creative. I call bullshit on that, right? You, you okay. do something, you do something that creates, that builds, that, that mm. you know, something becomes there that wasn't there before. And that could be, you know, you might be into building birdhouses or you might be into building renovations or you might be into sculpting or I don't care what it is, right? Yeah. But there needs to be some creativity in mm. your life and creativity cannot be squeezed in between tasks. Yeah. Just can't be done. And, and you know, there's, a, I've got a bit of a, um, uh, I don't know, a, a little mini belief happening. Now this, this is sort of all tying into you habits, you know, like yep. things that we work on together. But, you know, I feel that if I trimmed my beard, yeah, the tea part, I'm cutting off creativity. Oh, right, okay. maybe, the reason I believe that is because a lot of craft brewers, you know, craft beer brewers out there, yep. you see yep. them with their long beards and they're oh, like, yeah. I don't want that level. <laughs> I don't want that level. But yep. uh, with the whole home brewer, craft beer enthusiast thing, yep. uh, I find that, hey, yeah, the beard is an essential part of that. that I can create right. beer and although I haven't brewed for a while, but uh, you know, it's their little one percenters, you know, like that's my time. Like if I brew yeah. a beer, I get a yep. sun where it's going to be six hours yep. and have a few friends over and we'll just drink beer and have a barbecue and make beer. So we'll drink yep. beer while we make beer. That's, yep. That's well. It's just making those times. Uh, one of the, one of the books that profoundly, I know, I know you were going to ask me about books, so I got them out because <laughs> the question you asked me is like, what's the number one business book? Unfortunately, I can't, I got like racks and racks of these books. Yeah. Um, but uh, this book here called Happier yep. uh, by uh, Tal Ben-Shahar, who is a PhD doctorate. Uh, I think this is Harvard. Um, yep, yep, yep. Harvard. He's a Harvard professor. Right, and he's a former squash champion, and uh, he started uh, doing a course in Harvard on positive psychology. Mm -hmm. and, and I think someone sort of said, "Like, why don't you do that as a project?" And you know, he sort of thought, "Oh, if six students turn up, it'll be great." Yeah. It's now the most popular course in Harvard University, and he's written a book about it mm -hmm. and the whole thing. Right, so it's every bloke should get this book. Right. Yep. Um, everyone should get this book because it actually puts some um, solid thinking around the way we live our lives. Yep. And one of the, so for example, you know, there's the rat racer who just works hard, works hard and hopes that they're going to have a, a retirement or there's the person who goes, no, nah, bugger that. I'm going to, uh, the hedonist who just lives for now and doesn't worry about the future. Mm -hmm. And he talks about finding a balance between um, stuff that's enjoyable and has meaning to you, yeah. you know, and finding that balance. But one of the best things, uh, he, the concepts that come out of this is what I call happiness boosters. Oh yeah. Right. And, and he says, what makes you happy? You know, that could be drinking a, a glass of red wine with your missus when you get home. It could be playing the guitar. It could be kicking the soccer ball. It could be writing in a book. It could be, brewing beer, whatever, right? But what he's saying is traditionally what people have done is work like a dog until they retire and then with the hope that you'll enjoy it. That's not working for us currently. Yeah. What, and that's creating a lot of mental health issues and physical health issues and broken families and all that stuff. Yeah. What's working much better is deciding on the things that give you pleasure Mm. and the things that give you meaning and making sure you put a bit of those in each week and they're the happiness boosters. So yeah. one of the things I'd say to all the blokes on this call is work out what your happiness boosters are. Yeah. And make sure you do them every day, every week. And I'll give you an idea mm. of what some of mine are. Yep. So uh, one of mine is um, pouring a glass of wine and talking to my wife for 15 minutes because she wants 15 minutes to just have someone to listen to, you yep. know, that, yep. but that's a happiness booster. That's something I can give her. Mm. Um, a happiness booster is playing soccer. I still play competitive soccer with my mates. Mm. I love playing soccer. Um, sometimes when I've been in my head a lot, I feel like I've got to do something manual. 
So yeah. I'd grab a guitar and blast away, you know? So playing with my band, playing music is a happiness booster. So is writing. Writing's a happiness booster. Um, you know, so is getting out and having a really good breakfast at a coffee shop. Yeah. Right. So they're, Love they're not, Love it. Love it. I, you know, I surf, surf's a big, big happiness booster for me. So, mm. you know, if, if I get an afternoon in summer, I'll just get on, it's like 30 minutes that way, unfortunately, um, get down and get in the water and go for a blast, you know? So whatever your happiness booster is, You've got to do it more frequently. And, and I think that that's actually uh, a really strong strategy for managing your mood and managing your motivation and yep. managing all the shit that's going to come your way as a dad in your average week. Yeah, absolutely. I, I, think, it's, I think it's a key, uh, a key prerequisite to being indestructible, isn't it? Right. Oh, totally. Because uh, cause the opposite... While is that you never do anything, you know, because in the family I grew up in, that was considered selfish. Like if you did stuff for yourself, it was selfish. Yep. So I really fight that, you know. Oh, I, you know, I sit here and go, oh, I really, you know, I could blast off another couple of emails or I, I could do this, or I could do that. But then there's a part of me that goes, no, I need to go and do, take some time out, do play the guitar, do whatever I've got to do. Yeah. One of my happiness boosters Um yeah, what are they? Brewing. You have it. Well, I haven't brewed for a while. Um, the reason reason was I was brewing too much. And then I thought, ah. I looked down and I went, uh, when was that beer got there? Um, yeah. <laughs> you were con- not but, brewing too much. You were consuming too much. I was consuming too much. Um, and, and I was like, shit, I, I, I want to, you know, my dad had diabetes and had a heart attack and that was all diabetes and all that other stuff. And obviously he's yep. not- I sort of thought to myself, shit, I want to have a long, a long, happy, healthy life. Yep. Maybe I'll cut back it in, in a bit of the old home brewing, you know, and, um, and I, I was actually been a lot happier probably the last year. I've been going to the gym religiously yep. probably four times a week. Um, Exercise is huge for blokes, isn't it? Ridiculous. And, and, you know, I found that the, the chatter, the internal chatter, there's, there's conversations and shit going on inside your head that you don't, you're not even aware of. And then you get yeah. in. And I said it to Katrina because I'd, I'd recently moved gyms. So I didn't go to the gym for about three weeks. We would be yep. here at home and uh, not in that way, but you know, with proper kettlebells and stuff, but uh, yep. don't take that the wrong way. Um, but, <laughs> uh, you know, I just said to her, I need to go to a gym. I can't just do it here. You know what I mean? I need yep. to, I can do some things. I can so do have that accountability things. somewhere else, right? I just need to be in a place that I'm not instructing anyone. I'm not talking to anyone. I'm just like completely zoned out and my body's yep. doing work, you know, um, hockey, you know, so the gym yep. one, playing hockey is another one. Um, yeah. If I can't shoulder or elbow someone during the week, uh, <laughs> there's like, it, you know, it's a male thing, isn't it? It's like, yeah. You know, even just swinging a stick like golf. Golf, I haven't played golf for a while, yep. but that's because yep. the season's on. And um, yeah, that's a happiness booster. You know, like these are, they, there's tiny things like having lunch with Katrina, you know, and without the kids. Like I love them to bits, yep. but there's times where I just want to grab. You need grab some time. time. And it's like, come on, woman, we're going to lunch and we're going to have three, three or four pints while we're at lunch. And we're yep. going to talk about shit. And we're going to yep. laugh. And we're just going to. You know, we're going to have fucking, we're going to bet on fucking dogs or some shit. We're going to, yeah. no, we're going to, we're going to we'll bet on Korean badminton. I don't give a shit. Right. We're, we're yeah, yeah, fun, yeah. You know? um, we're just going to get out. And yeah, we'll you've stuff totally got to do that. Like make time. Um, one of the, uh, the best things I did uh, that I'm really, really pleased I did this. Uh, my dad died about 12 years ago, fairly unexpectedly. He was a fit mm. and healthy bloke, um, had a stroke and off, off he was. But yeah. we used to, for the sort of 10 years or so prior to that, mm. once a month, we'd, I'd take the day off and he'd take the day off and we'd go and have a game of golf. Yeah. And, you know, there's a part of, there was always a part of me going, oh, geez, that's a day I'm not working. Yep. Um, now he's not here and I've got all these great memories of doing stuff with him. Yeah. Um, so that's, that's a bit of the, you know, just stop being so busy, stop having these big expectations of yourself and take some time to 
connect mm. with that in that case. You know, I'm so pleased I did because, you know, uh, now would have been the time when he would have probably thought, I've got time to do that. Yeah. But he's not here. Yeah, that's it. And, and I mean, look, my, my dad and I, we were a bit up and down the last sort of year um, that yep. he, before, before he passed away again, stroke. Okay. Um, you know, it was, uh, yeah, I mean, I think there was a personality clash because I'd grown up and I think he missed early stages of like teenage years yeah. and stuff like that and oh, all these different journeys, you know, but you sort of go, you know, what do I remember? You know, what do I remember when somebody's gone? You remember how you felt and the experiences you shared. You don't remember the fact that, hey, he's, yeah. he spent 12 hours a night working in a factory yeah. a labeling machine. You don't remember that shit. You remember, you remember the, you know, the fun with the kids at the show or, you know, yeah. them wanting to go see their poppy or. Yeah, or, yeah, exactly. So um, it's a, I think that that's a big wake up call for dads is just going, shit, invest, invest in experiences, make sure yeah. you're the best version of you for them. Yeah. Uh, if you're, if you run a business. Take uh, time out. You leverage your team and take time out and don't be, don't yeah. be a master. Um, yeah. So, so what we might do, we might, uh, we might uh, wrap up with a little 60, sec- 60 second entrepreneurial flash round. Oh, yeah. I'm not good at 60 seconds. It may go longer. So we'll see how we go. Well, well 60 seconds is a guideline for people like you and I. <laughs> um, so if it's 10 minutes, that's fine. It's 10 minutes. So tell me, actually, before we go anywhere, you used to be part of a networking group that met up for breakfast. Yes. Yep. Were you one of the guys they used to have the horn for at 60 seconds or did you have it down pat? Uh, no, I had it down pat. Right. Oh, so because wow. well, part of what I do for a living is uh, keynote speaking and uh, that sort of stuff. And um, and the thing is, every nanosecond you go over time, everyone in the room resents you. Yes. So yep. so if I'm booked for an hour, if I go an hour and one minute, what mm. they'll remember is he bloody well went over time. They won't remember the hour that I. Uh, and I think it's the same in those breakfast meetings. If you've got 60 seconds and you go to 70 seconds, mm. I, it doesn't matter what you said. Everyone resents the crap out of you. So yeah. Yeah. I'm like, no, I finish on the dot and I, I plan it and practice it. We but used to- I'm yeah. a professional presenter. That's that's. <laughs> I got that baby down pat. Well, we used to have a gong. You know, we borrowed it from uh, the Rotary Club because we yeah. had yeah. members. And I went, can you guys bring that gong? And they're like, yeah, yeah, we'll bring it. And yeah, we had a we had a person who would always go over, and everyone's like, "What are you doing? What are you doing?" So we had the gong, and yep. for sixty seconds of time, I went nod, bang, wrong, wrong every week, and then yeah. it happened twice, and then she was, right. then she stuck to sixty seconds, which was amazing, amazing. Everyone yeah. loved. Yeah, and, and here's the interesting thing about that because I was in a really large group, and so there was always, always, always the people that continuously went over. Here's the lesson that I don't think people get about that. Mm. How you do anything is how people think you do everything. Yeah. So if you're given a 60 second deadline and you ignore it mm. and you just do whatever the hell you want mm. and you want people to, to, you know, use your services, they're going to go, well, he or she ignores the guidelines and does whatever they want to do. So mm. I don't know whether I want to do that. So, I reckon no matter what you do, Mm. how you do it, people are looking at it and going, okay, so that's the way they're going to do it. You know, does that work for me? So I, I would say if you're in business and you're a dad watching this and uh, you know, you think, Oh, you know what? I don't think it matters if I turn up late or I don't think it matters if I look a bit crappy, it matters. Oh, how you do anything is how you'll do everything. That, that, uh, lateness. I actually had somebody ask me, and this was a couple of years ago. Um, she was ki- consistently late every week. And it even happened here in Bathurst. So, you know, people continuously late. Yep. I, uh, yeah, I'm not, I'm not going to, I don't want to borrow it because, and, no. like, oh. and I was <laughs> like, well, if you don't respect, if you don't respect everyone else to get there on time, like they do. Yep. Are you above them? And they're like, no, anyway, that's a bit harsh, but uh, yeah. I, was like, oh, I can't like, if you're going to be late for sessions, that means you're going to expect me to be 15 minutes late for my next one because you're yeah, that's right. What's doing? Um, yeah. I will say on that, I like being comfortable in my own skin. Um, yep. so 
you know, if I can't wear footy shorts and a polo to a client in summer, <laughs> yeah. future for us, baby. Um, but yeah. Yeah. And that's your own flavor. That's your own thing. Flavor. I've got a hoodie on now for those of you who can't see me. Um, <laughs> just go to YouTube, YouTube uh, The Indestructible Dad, you'll get a video of this, uh, of this uh, recording. Um, so, yeah, uh, let's just say flash round, entrepreneurial flash round. Favorite business book? Excellent. Favorite, so, okay, so I've got a bunch of them. So I've already told you about Happier. Yes. I've told you about Essentialism. Yes. Um, one of my favorite authors is Malcolm Gladwell. And if you haven't heard of Malcolm Gladwell, he has, uh, the, probably his most famous book is Outliers. Yes. Uh, Outliers is um, it's just one of his books. But any one of Malcolm's books are both brilliant, insightful, and hugely entertaining. Uh, this one is David and Goliath, which is all about underdogs, misfits, and the art of battling giants. It's awesome. Um, so the other book that I quite like is uh, one of my mentors, Marshall Goldsmith. Uh, Marshall Goldsmith is the world's number one executive coach, uh, and he's also the author of What Got You Here Won't Get You There and a few other bits and pieces. This is his latest book. Um, but basically anything Marshall writes is a bit like Malcolm Gladwell. It's gold. Love it. So that's, that's a tiny cross section of books that's got my attention at the moment. Oh, I like those. I'll have to get that happy one. Um, now you mentioned, uh, Marshall's one of your mentors. Yes. Yep. Uh, rattle off a couple of other names. It doesn't have so, to be four or five. It could be just three most influential. So Marshall, Marshall was incredibly influential. Marshall is, uh, you know, he's a, he's a PhD doctor, um, in, psychology, I think it is, uh, but he's become a, this business uh, guru. And uh, I spent two days with him in Vegas a couple of years ago, which is pretty cool. Yeah. Um, and, and he actually wrote, the for, uh, wrote, a, wrote a testimonial forward for one of my books as well. Um, one of the things that he said that really did affect me a lot is he wrote 36 books before he was successful as an author. And... <laughs> Right? And, and now he got he gets paid a couple of million bucks. You know he gets a he gets an advance for these books now. Yeah. Um, but thirty six books, um, and he said just write, write with other people. You know, put ten of you together and write a book. Write your own book. Just write and get it out there. Get your ideas out there. Yep. Um, because they don't have to be perfect. Just get them out there. However you do it. And so he really encouraged me. And the way he works and the way he um, profoundly impacts people's lives that he works with. Mm. Uh, it's the definition of leverage. He doesn't, you know, he doesn't necessarily, you know, sit intensely with them for 10 hours at a stretch. Yeah. But what he does in a short period of time is really impact the way they think. Uh, and he certainly did that for me. So Marshall's um, fantastic. I, I like his model of, um, of the way he helps people. I like the model of his business. Yeah. Um, I straight, you know, I really struggle with that as a, that as a question of what are my other mentors? Cause unfortunately um, most of the mentors are kind of flawed, you know, they're mm. um, there's things I don't particularly love about them, you know, I, like, or that aren't relevant to me, you know, like Gary V is a really popular guy at the moment and all that sort of stuff. Um, but you know what? He started with a very wealthy family, you know, and like, you know, he started with. Yeah. He started with a bit of it. Millions. Yeah. Right. And oh, that's I, not me. I start with nothing. Yeah. It's a, it's an interesting one. Cause you know, when I, when I mentioned at the start of ours, you know, my three uh, influential, obviously, you know, there's you, you know, yep. um, Brad, who I yep. would say he's a he's a a giant when it comes to leverage because he can leverage yep. the shit out of things, and then yep. on the other hand you've got uh, Grant Cardone, yeah, who is, who realistically is the king of hustle. So yeah, a leverage a leverage dude, a hustle dude, right, and, right, and dude, you know, and it's like that's quite a cross section of stuff going on there. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And, and look, another guy I'm really liking at the moment uh, is um, Tim Ferriss. Yeah. Uh, he's the author of the four hour work week, but he's got a blog, uh, not a blog, a podcast at the moment. Yep. He just is a really interesting guy. Don't agree with a lot of some of what he says, 
Yep. But if I look at that as a model, as a as a way of doing things, yep. um, you know, I think that's that's pretty cool. So I'm I describe myself as a pluralist. Yep. Uh, and and what I mean by that is I will take inspiration from anywhere. Mm. Uh, so, you know, I, I, I take certain inspiration from Seth Godin, who I, I quite like. I take certain inspiration from Brad. Um, every author I work with inspires me in some way. So mm. there's... Oh, I think you know, <laughs> yeah. oh, yeah, especially in... Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, very yeah. inspirational. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and there's stuff I learn, you know, from everybody. And... For me, when I think of mentors, really what I'm thinking about is um, one of the things that I think has made me relatively successful and I, and I see in other successful people is they are permanently curious mm. about how stuff works, yep. um, you know, and, and why stuff works and, you know, how do you do that? How does Brad do leverage? How does Brad do that? How does you know, Wayne do that, you know, and I think just being, having the humility to just say, oh, what could I learn in this situation? Even if the person you're learning it from, you don't particularly like, mm. what could I learn? Um, that means I can learn from anyone. Yeah. No, anyone. That is, that is a, that is such a great trait to have, you know? Yeah. Um, you know, like sometimes the Tory, you know, the Taurus bull will come out in me where I'm like, you know, I might be listening to something. I'm like, I fucking hate this. I need to, yeah, yeah. I need to fucking change the channel. But then the other side of me that, you know, if I've got, if I've got a nice, um, nice blue head on me, you just go, Oh, yep. What can I, yeah. how can I take this in a different way? You know what I mean? Yeah. Depending on have I had my happiness booster for this day, week, month. Right. Right. Typical dad, yeah. typical dad BS there. Um, yeah. Right. So, so one of the other guys that really profoundly influenced me is a guy called Stan Jordan. He was my coach for a couple of years. Yeah. Um, he's just a guy like most people will not know who he is, uh, but he is 82 and he's still working and still loving his work. Um, he's inspired me basically to never retire. Uh, now when I say never retire, what that means is I have, I'm not going to do that. I'm 65. So I'm retiring. What I'm going to do is I'm just going to do stuff I really enjoy doing and work out how to get paid for it Yeah. for the rest of my life. Yeah. And that's kind of what he does. Um, but one of the things Stan, Stan challenged, because I think when you're 80, you just don't, you don't put up with bullshit anymore. <laughs> so I'd turn up and say this and he just goes, Brett, just stop it. Just stop. Yes, no, no, I'm like, like what? And I'd, I would be like, well, this guy spoke, but he was kind of a dickhead and I didn't like him and just yeah. stop stop unless you can stand in you know mm. like real learning is standing in the thick of that with someone you don't like and still being able to learn from them that's yeah. what real learning is and i'm like okay and you just you can't argue with a wise old 80 year old because they just don't take bullshit anymore yeah. he sees he sees straight through that he sees straight, straight through, that. through it. yeah straight through um so so finally uh what's one motto to share with uh, any uh, dads out there you know, a, a phrase, a motto, a belief. Yep. Obviously, yep. we've spoken about uh, being able to, you know, um, you know, find the positive in any solution and, and learn more. But uh, yep. little... I've got, got a bunch of them. and But I'll just share a few that mean a lot to me. Yep. The first one is progress, not perfection. Oh. I, I love that. Right? But anyway. But, and, it's, and it's not mine. It's, I don't know whose it is. But yep. uh, a really good um, uh, example of it is General George Patton, who was a very famous Second World War general. And yep. he said that an imperfect plan violently executed today is better than a perfect plan next week. Yeah. So an imperfect plan violently executed today is better than a perfect plan next week. Now, mm -hmm. I would just rephrase that and say an imperfect plan enthusiastically started today is better than a perfect plan next week or an imperfect book enthusiastically done today is better than the perfect book next week. Yes. So I think about that in a lot of ways uh, in all the business, you know, um, just, just get a campaign out there, do a Facebook campaign. It won't be perfect. Just work it out, you yeah. know, produce a new thing, call a new client, 
do a thing. It won't be perfect. Just make progress. And so as long as I'm progressing, mm. even a little bit, I'm okay with that. Progressing yeah. as a dad, as a father, as a business guy, as a musician, that's really cool. Yeah. Um, I think the other saying is that um, uh, everything I do, everything I say, every feeling I have, every thought I have is my choice. It's yeah. my choice, so take responsibility for it. Uh, you know, if someone cuts me off in traffic and I blow up at them, I'm choosing to blow up at them. Yep. Which then begs the question, well, what if I chose something different? What if I just chose to let it go? Yeah. Would I be happier? Most times, yeah. So yeah. then, you know, the teenagers have a crack at you like they usually do. You know, how was your day, Dale? Wah! And you're like, okay, so I could choose to say, don't talk to me like that. Or I could choose just to go, tough day then and let it go. So <laughs> everything's a choice. Yeah. Even if someone comes up and punches me in the face, what yeah. I do about that is still my choice. Yeah. yeah. I can choose to re react or I can choose to walk away or, or what, right? It's all my choice. Yeah. Uh, that gives me enormous power, enormous power. And I think a lot of people forget that power, don't they? You know, oh, it's, it's I, I heard something very similar. It was probably is exactly that. Um, Marco Pierre White, you know, he's he's known to he's known as the guy who made and Gore, made Gordon Ramsay cry. Right. Okay. They asked, yeah. they asked him about it, and he goes, "Well, I didn't make Gordon cry. Gordon chose to cry. There's a big difference, you know." <laughs> it's like, yeah, like you, yeah, it's the same. You didn't make me angry. I chose to be angry about what you said. Yeah. That yeah. that changed my relationship actually my because after four years of marriage everything got pretty yeah. tough but learning that my wife didn't make me anything that i chose chose my reaction that changed everything yeah completely so that's a really important one so progress and that it's always my choice mm. um i think but here's the thing that i want every dad on this program to know mm. um and if I could make a billboard or if I could have a saying, something along this line would probably be it. You guys are more powerful than you think you are. You have no idea the strength and the power you have. So whatever you do, you've got this. You can do it. Yeah. And, and I reckon not enough dads know that. Yeah. Right? So do it. Don't do it perfectly, do it imperfectly. Yeah. But you've got this, yeah. right? And that's what I want them to know. It doesn't matter whether they decide to homebrew, start their own business, start a family, get out of a bad relationship, whatever it is, you've got this. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. and I think that's, that's, we don't get told that enough. No, no, we don't. We don't. So that's, that's what I want them to know. Well, that's a, that's a beautiful message. Um, and we may have to actually change the title of the episode to You Got This. Damn it. Yeah. But that's a, <laughs> perfect. But it's no. perfect. You know, we're like, you know, and, I, and I'll agree. Like, when I was growing up, I never imagined I'd have four kids. Yep. Never. You know, yep. like from a divorce background where, you know, one parent here, one parent there, you know, two hours away from each other. And, yeah. and now it's like, you know, my we chose you know i'll say katrina i chose how we raise our kids and how we yep. will operate as a family unit yeah. which is impenetrable to bullshit you know what i mean yeah and yeah. there's too many families out there are, are torn apart every day because they refuse to make that choice make a choice of yep. how things are going to be you know so yeah because your capacity your power is greater than you think absolutely absolutely much greater than really is so amazing. yes yeah. we're, amazing. we're indestructible anyway brett we'll let you go thank you very much for uh it's been my pleasure three it was it was really enlightening and yeah i can't wait for uh some uh feedback and some questions that we can we can probably do a follow-on q a i'm sure we will uh, love to anytime all right awesome anytime. thanks brett all right dude thanks for having me cheers